Hey friends, good morning. Welcome back. We are this morning, we're going to finish Nehemiah chapter 4. If you remember from our devotion on Friday, we were talking about how there's a second wave of attack that's been coming to the Israelites. We see five different enemies that have been listed in the earlier part of chapter 4, and now they're plotting against Jerusalem, the people there, to try to thwart whatever's going on and to cause the work to cease, cause the people to become uh, despondent and to not want to continue the work. There's just a lot of pressure, a lot of evil going on in the background. But we also see Nehemiah's strength, his leadership, his his spiritual, uh, you know, the, the leading that he has there for the people to see that this gets done because he knows God's behind this and he wants these people to be reminded of that as they work. And so what the end of chapter four is going to do is it's going to wrap things up for us, give us a few more details about exactly what's going on as they continue the work. Remember now we got the wall about halfway high, about waist high or so. So as it's starting to get taller, the work's getting harder. There's a lot of pressure and we see how Nehemiah deals with that and how he tries to lead the people to deal with that. But also in this part of the passage, we're going to see the preparation that they take just in case, just in case there's an attack, just in case they do have to defend their lives. How are they going to do that? And that's what this part of the passage tells us. So I'm going to begin in verse 15 and move toward the end of the chapter. When our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had frustrated their plan, we all returned to the wall, each to his work. From that day on, half of my servants worked on construction and half held the spear, shields, bows, and coats of mail. And the leaders stood behind the whole house of Judah who were building on the wall. Those who carried burdens were loaded in such a way that each labored on the work with one hand and held his weapon with the other. And each of the builders had his sword strapped at his side while he built. The man who sounded the trumpet was beside me. And I said to the nobles and the officials and to the rest of the people, The work is great and widely spread, and we are separated on the wall, far from one another. And the place where you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there. Our God will fight for us. So we labored at the work, and half of them held the spears from the break of dawn until the stars came out. I also said to the people at that time, let every man and his servant pass the night within Jerusalem, that they may be a guard for us by night and may labor by day. So neither I nor my brothers nor my servants nor the men of the guard who followed me, none of us took off our clothes. Each kept his weapon at his right hand. And so you see Nehemiah is describing for us these ways in which they are preparing themselves just in case there really is a fight on their hands that's going to come about. And as we look at verse 15, it says, When our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had frustrated their plan, we all returned to the wall, each to his work. Do you, do you see what happened here? Nehemiah is actually telling us that God had thwarted the plans of the enemy by allowing Israel to uncover or to hear about their secret meeting. Now it's public. Israel finds out about this diabolical plan and now they prepare themselves to fight. Except in their preparation to fight, they don't quit building. They're doubly preparing as the wall of Jerusalem is slowly rising higher. So they work, but they're also ready to defend their lives at a moment's notice. Now, they're not sure what to do. The secret's out, and Israel is no one to be trifled with. I'm talking about their enemies here. I'm not sure how this is possible, but whatever assembly that these people can muster, whatever defensive measures that they're able to put into place, apparently it's enough to abate the impending attack of these five different surrounding enemies. Whatever it is, however it, whatever it looks like, it's enough. And perhaps what's more fearful to these five foes, maybe they're starting to understand that they have God on their side. You know, often in battles like these or uh, in conquering lands and nations as they're warring against one another, the real issue at hand for many of these peoples would be whose God is stronger. 
And if one people attacked another and conquered them, then they would believe, well, our God is stronger because we beat you and vice versa. Knowing what's going on now with that mentality, as the enemies of Israel around them are seeing the success of Israel, it's very likely that they're realizing they have a God, well, as we know, God alone on their side. This is a supernatural element behind what's going on here. Unless they're really choosing to be willfully ignorant, no doubt they see that God is guiding them, that God is protecting them while this work continues. And as you look at verses 16 through 20, from that day on, half my servants worked on construction and half held the spears, shields, bows, and coats of mail. And the leaders stood behind the whole house of Judah, who were building on the wall. Those who carried burdens were loaded in such a way that each labored on the work with one hand and held his weapon with the other. And each of the builders had his sword strapped at his side while he built. The man who sounded the trumpet was beside me. So let's stop there for a moment. Nehemiah is not simply a supervisor here who's trying to make sure that the work gets done, barking orders and so forth. He's acting like a general, ready to go to war with his comrades, should that become necessary. And so what he does, as we look at verse 18, we've got this guy with a trumpet. And then he says in verse 19, I said to the nobles and the officials and the rest of the people, the work is great and widely spread, and we are separated on the wall far from one another. In the place where you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there. Our God will fight for us. So he's now set up this method to warn others because he realizes, hey, look, we're spread across a mile and a half to two and a half mile long uh, circumference of wall. So if you hear a trumpet sound, rally to that point. Go to where you hear the trumpet sound. That is the place where there is an impending attack. And so Nehemiah is watching over his brethren as he continues to lead the repair efforts. And notice that he doesn't tell the nobles and the workers, hey guys, it's going to be fine. We've got this. We'll wipe them out with our weapons. We know what we're doing. But rather, if you notice at the end of verse 20, he says, God will fight for us. See, even in this moment, again, Nehemiah puts his trust, his strength, his future, into the hands of a sovereign God. He has providentially taken care of them thus far. Why would he fail now? He cannot fail as we know. He is the unchanging God. The one, as the psalmist tells us, who shows us steadfast love. It's repeated over and over again in the Psalms. But I also want to point out how ready these people are. I mean, think about this. They're literally working with one hand, and guarding a weapon on the other. They're ready to work or ready to fight at a moment's notice. They're prepared to respond in seconds, not minutes, not hours. So should the enemy attack in that moment, they could simply drop the trowel or the tool in their hand and pick up the sword and spear to defend their lives. I mean, that's that gives a new emphasis to the kind of Minutemen type of idea like soldiers had back in the American Revolutionary days. So if you look at the last part now of chapter 4, verses 21 through 23, it says, So we labored at the work, and half of them held the spears from the break of dawn until the stars came out. I also said to the people at that time, Let every man and his servant pass the night within Jerusalem that they may be a guard for us by night and may labor by day. So neither I nor my brothers nor my servants nor the men of the guard who followed me, none of us took off our clothes. Each kept his weapon at his right hand. So as we come to the final few verses in chapter 4, we see that Nehemiah is setting a guard that is 24 hours. Nehemiah is determined to also set the example here and lead by example. They kept themselves so busy, so on guard, they didn't even stop to take a bath. I mean, that's dedication. They're, they're working on this in 12-hour shifts. So what Nehemiah has done is he's expanded the working hours. 
They're trading off roles. So as one guards through the night, another labors throughout the daytime. That means everyone's got to get involved to make this work. There's this constant cycle of guarding and working, guarding and working. And God's blessing that. And he's strengthening them for the task. Now, he does change direction a little bit, Nehemiah does. In light of these threats, as I said before, he does extend the working hours from basically dawn till dusk. He wants to try to get as much work done while there's daylight. And they're working fast and they're working hard, as we've talked about. This is going to be finished in 52 days. They want to make sure that they have a primary line of defense with this wall against an impending attack. So basically they're preparing as if it is inevitably going to happen. And he also, I hope you notice that he tries to keep everyone inside the city walls. Now while verse 23 sounds kind of strange, because we don't take off our clothes, we don't bathe, whatever, it explains to us that it, they didn't go outside to do anything. Let me read that again. Actually, in verse 22, I also said to the people at the time, let every man and his servants pass the night within Jerusalem. Don't go out at night, he's saying, so that they may be a guard for us by day and may labor. And then he says in verse 23, so neither I nor anyone else, none of us took up our clothes, each kept his weapon in his right hand. So he's trying to keep everyone inside is a safety precaution. It's likely they would have had to go outside to bathe, to find like a local river or creek water supply. And they discontinued that in the interest of personal safety. So to summarize all that we've read this morning, I want you to see that Nehemiah has responded very well to the threats of the enemies around him. Remember, he seeks God's face first in the middle of these conflicts. He encourages his brethren to put their hope, put their trust in God. And he's led with wisdom and care as he sets an example and pushes the people to secure their border even faster. He arms the people who are working. He establishes an alarm system in case of an attack. None of these responses that Nehemiah makes are fearful. Rather, they're faithful. Faithful to God, faithful to his own people. They know who is on their side. And so then they respond in a way that makes God a huge part of the equation in the circumstance. And the question for us this morning then would be, do we respond like that? When we face trials and situations, it is our first response to go to God in prayer. And then when we act, do we do it and make God part of the equation. God is sovereign. God is good. God is just. God is holy. God is in charge of my life and my circumstances. How dare we make plans without him being the center focus in all of that? Look at what Nehemiah has done. All of his plans, yes, they arm themselves. Yes, they set watches. But yet he also said, our God will fight for us. He has not lost sight of the fact that God has called them to do this. This wasn't some crazy idea that Nehemiah concocted in a dream one night. He's doing God's will. Now I want to close by reading from Raymond Brown. Many of you probably don't know who he is. He wrote a book called The Message of Nehemiah. And in his book, referring to chapter 4 here in the text, Brown points out that there are several revelations that God makes about himself in what we've read so far. In fact, there's eight different things that God has revealed about himself just in chapter 4. Number one, God is unique. Number two, God is attentive. Three, God is righteous. For God is powerful. Five, God is holy. Six, God is sovereign. Seven, God is unfailing. And as I said before, number eight, God will fight for us. 
Friends, these revelations in chapter 4 and these promises are just as true today for us. Why are these devotionals so good for us to do together? Why is spending time in the Word paramount to our sanctification and our spiritual growth? Well, it's because God's Word is first and foremost about Himself. So may we continue to pour over it as we desire to learn more about Him, which I pray will only increase our desire to love Him and to serve Him even more. Friends, I hope you have a great week. Hope you'll spend some time in the devotions of Dr. Beck and the Psalms this week as well. But I'll see you next time.